What would you do if you were stuck in one place and every day was exactly the same and nothing that you did mattered? If this video is up in time for Christmas, it would genuinely be a Christmas miracle because I only started working on it today, which is the 21st of December. Um, thank you to... <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Uh, thanks anyway for suggesting this video. On my last video, the channel update about Studio Ghibli, I finished by kind of rambling that maybe I should try and make a Christmas video and you suggested I do one on Groundhog Day which is a genius choice really. Um, the difficulty is I'd never seen Groundhog Day before until this morning um, despite meaning to for quite a while which means I've, I've kind of challenged myself to watch this entirely new movie, analyse it and get the editing done in four days. Um, so you know if this isn't up by Christmas don't blame me and if it is <laughs> Merry Christmas! So to the film, Groundhog Day, if you haven't seen the film like I hadn't, I'll imagine you're still kind of familiar with the premise. Phil Connors, a weatherman, gets stuck in a sort of time loop reliving the same day over and over again for eternity pretty much. And it happens stuck in this town, this small town called Puxatawney. And it's a brilliant film, I absolutely loved it. In many ways, you could kind of call it a modern adaptation of Dickens's A Christmas Carol. Um, in the sense it stars an arrogant, selfish man who doesn't really like other people and that he gets forced into some sort of supernatural situation that enables him to change. You know, like um, Scrooge becomes generous by the end of A Christmas Carol and Phil Connors here becomes selfless. I'm going to begin with a quick point on the film's opening because it's it's an odd opening in many ways. As the credits come up we get a shot of the clouds in the sky while the music being played is a brass band. Um, that you know, that very typical sort of pompous brass band circusy marching style music. I don't I don't really know what you call it exactly, but it's music you'd kind of associate with the uh, the farcical, the the sense of something ridiculous. And personally, I think it's the perfect choice of music for the way Phil Connors looks at life. He um, he frequently refers to people being morons in this film. You know, people like blood sausage too. People are morons. He has this very elevated view of himself that places him above them, the one sane person in the world of idiots. And so, to him, life is farcical. The way everybody else lives is farcical. The idea of a town of people who gather excitedly every year for Groundhog Day is ridiculous to him. So I guess the passing of time, which is what these clouds show us in a way, is a ludicrous brass band parade. And in part he's right to see the town of Poxatawney as ridiculous and the other people in this film as ridiculous. Um, Groundhog Day is a local celebration where they pull a groundhog from a box, talk to it, and then from that draw some weather prediction about how long the winter is going to last for. <laughs> That is ridiculous. And so, farcical brass band music, which also plays for the Groundhog Day event itself, kind of underpins that perfectly. The twist, however, we'll discover, is um, basically, so what that it's ridiculous? You know, the idea of Christmas, which I think Groundhog Day is kind of paralleling in some way, but the idea of Christmas is ridiculous. A fat man who rides a sleigh of flying reindeer and comes down the chimney to deliver presents. It's ridiculous, but so what, you know? Because we enjoy Christmas, it's a chance for presents, kids enjoy the idea of Santa, it's a chance for family to come together and if nothing else it's just something to celebrate. It, it doesn't matter what we're celebrating, it's just nice to celebrate something once in a while. So what is ridiculous and the twist comes really when you understand that, idiots or not, all the townspeople of Puxatawney are happy. Morning. You have to see the groundhog? Reet is happy. Everyone in this film is happy except for Phil because if you place yourself above others like Phil does, you place yourself alone. You're isolated. For your information, Erdu, there is a major network interested in me. And so in that sense, the real idiot, the real farce is Phil himself. In a town where everybody, absolutely everybody, kindly tries to reach out to him, everybody tries to spread their joy, extends their warmth, 
and happiness and festivity to him. He's stupid enough to push them away. Looking foxy tonight, man. Hey, uh, is your troop gonna be selling cookies again this year? He, he doesn't want it. He refuses and instead acts like he's somebody much better. So he doesn't go to dinner with Rita and Larry when they invite him. He doesn't go to the dance. He arrives late to Groundhog Day itself and leaves as soon as he's done his report. He doesn't want to spend a second longer with these people than is absolutely necessary. Um, and in all these interactions with them, he's condescending and aloof and totally distanced. It's like this is a town of happy people and he's trying to fight against their happiness, not let it infect him, but that's kind of the stupidity because why wouldn't you let that happiness in? Why wouldn't you want to be infected with their joy? And so that's the bitter irony of this film. Phil looks on everybody else like they're pathetic, farcical comedy characters, failing to realise he's really the comedy character, he's the idiot we're all laughing at. This brass band music that opens the film, in a sense, is his theme music. And so that's kind of a very long-winded summary about one small point on this film. Um, so I'm now going to try and rush through the next bit of this video and kind of more discuss the general themes, but I'm going to go through it quickly because I think a lot of people have already discussed this stuff. Phil basically, in the course of this film, learns to be selfless. Stuck reliving Groundhog Day forever, he at first tries to fix the problem, you know, how can I get out of this time loop, how can I escape? And inevitably he fails to escape, so he then starts trying to exploit this loop for his personal means. What if there were no tomorrow? No tomorrow? That would mean there would be no consequences, there would be no hangovers, we could do whatever we wanted! Manipulating what he learns about Nancy one day to get her to sleep with him the next. Nancy, Lincoln, Walsh. Lincoln High School! I sat next to you in Mrs. Walsh's English class. Driving like a maniac because it doesn't matter if he gets arrested. Like any kid with a lot of toys though, it eventually gets boring and feels empty. So next he turns to Rita and he desires her. So he starts trying to manufacture the perfect date with her. Every time he slips up or gets something wrong or says something she doesn't quite like, he then tries again the next day, you know, changing it a little each time until it's the perfect date. Would you like to try some white chocolate? Yuck, gonna make me sick. No white chocolate. But he still doesn't win her because she sees through it. You know, he doesn't actually truly love her or admire her or care about her or even, he's not even interested in her as a person. It's all just facts he's wanting to learn so that he can manipulate them to his advantage in the aim of getting her to sleep with him. And then, at this point, he doesn't know what else to do with his life and he can't escape Groundhog Day so he tries to kill himself. But that doesn't end the time loop. He just wakes up again at 6am and he tries it again, various different ways of attempting to kill himself, but it, none of it works. So what else can he do at this point in the film? Surrounded by these happy people trying to share their joy with him, he's kept his distance, he's exploited them, and he's gotten bored with doing both. So what else can he do but stop refusing? Let their joy in. Start caring. And that's his arc in this film, he goes from this arrogant, selfish man to someone quite selfless. So he starts caring for the people of Puxatawney. The tramp he used to blank, he now helps out. And when he discovers the tramp dies, he starts trying to find ways to save his life, just as he saves a choking man from dying, a kid from falling from a tree, and just about every other small, conceivable kind act that might help out the townspeople. And gradually, he does start to genuinely care. And then, as a result, he's released from the time loop and can finally carry on the rest of his life. Except it's not quite that simple. Um, and this is what I really wanted to talk about. It's taken me so long to get here, but what I really wanted to talk about in this video is A, why he starts to care and become selfless, and B, what this whole metaphor of Groundhog Day is really about. So, why does he start to care? Essentially because Rita teaches him to care. Stuck here, he becomes increasingly lonely. Naturally, he wants to talk to someone about how depressing this experience is of reliving the same day with people who forget the events. He wants to open up and get the feelings off his chest, so he talks to Rita. You know, after he's given up trying to manufacture this perfect date, he just 
honestly talks and tells her about his predicament. And he starts out the conversation by framing it as, I'm a god. Because this is Phil, he's very egocentric. So of course that's how he looks on the situation. I'm stuck in Groundhog Day, it must be I am a god. Uh, but as the conversation goes on and he gives examples of absolutely every minute detail about the surrounding people, everything he knows about them, everything that happens, because he's seen it play out a million times. And when he's able to give all these examples, you see how lonely and empty an existence that is for him. If he is a god, it's a very lonely curse. Which ties back to what I said earlier, if you place yourself above others, you isolate yourself. By being aloof, you become alone. So, in elevating himself to the very highest level of all, calling himself a god, Phil becomes painfully, painfully lonely. I think arrogance can often be a defence against feeling lonely, um, because it's uncomfortable to feel lonely. It makes us feel like there must be something wrong with us, which isn't really all that true, but it makes us feel like that. So, so naturally you might defend against that feeling by deciding, well, I'm only alone because everyone else is too stupid to match my level. I'm just on an intellect above them. And so in that state, you might start acting aloof because that thought is more comfortable than the thought, oh God, maybe it's me, maybe I'm not very likeable, and all those sort of ideas. And that's Phil on some level. And hence the popular myth that intelligent people tend to be more unhappy. Because that is a myth, it might be statistically true that a lot of intelligent people are unhappy, but they're not unhappy because of their intelligence. Intelligent people are only unhappy when they lack the wisdom to match their intelligence. Hence why Buddhist monks or Taoists can tend to be some of the happiest people on earth, because they have wisdom to match their intelligence. Intelligence itself doesn't make you unhappy, it's a, it's a bit like a tool, um, in the same sense fame doesn't make you unhappy unless you don't know how to use it correctly, you aren't able to manage it, you aren't able to cope. Um, people like child actors particularly get thrown into this mad world of fame before they're ready to cope and it can send them off the rails like Macaulay Culkin in his younger days for example. Intelligence itself isn't the cause of sadness, that, that is just an excuse we regularly use to make ourselves feel better. Anyway, that was a tangent. Um, he confides in her. She believes the story enough to decide. Maybe I should spend the rest of the day with you as an objective witness just to see what happens. And so again, they spend a lot of time together, but the key difference now to when they were doing it, manufacturing the perfect day is that Phil is no longer trying to sleep with her because you know, what's the point? He's still stuck here, he's still alone, she'll still completely forget the encounter the next day. So he's just being himself now, just sitting on a bed doing something as dull as throwing cards into a hat. A pointless, boring, stupid, ridiculous thing to do. Just as ridiculous as celebrating a groundhog's weather predictions is. You know, just as ridiculous as finding it amusing to watch your blue coat disappear in front of a blue screen. This isn't the aloof sort of highbrow thing Phil is known for. This is more like the sort of act he would sneer at others for enjoying. This act they're doing now is more like Rita's approach to life, which is finding fun in the smallest of things. So throwing cards in a hat seems like a dull thing to do, and yet both he and Rita now find it fun. I want you to know it's been a really nice day for me. Me too. And maybe, if it's not too boring, we could do it again sometime. I hope so. And it's fun because it's genuine human connection, really. It's not the act itself, it's the fact he's doing it with someone. You know, he's confided his feelings and they talk while they do this and they joke a bit and it's all real and genuine. And that's what he realises, that it was a fun day doing something as simple as throwing cards in a hat. It was just fun to let life happen for a bit, you know, and he realises Rita is a fun person to be with beyond just wanting to fuck her. <laughs> he realises he genuinely enjoys her company. He enjoys her positive, loving, open approach to life. As the day winds down to its end and she falls asleep, he says this. I think you're the kindest sweetest, prettiest person I've ever met in my life. I've never seen anyone that's nicer to people than you are. You know what's so revolutionary about that? 
it's that he's admiring something about somebody else. He's not being egocentric here, he's admiring her as a person. Which of course is a big part of what separates desire from love, that you actually care and are actually interested in the person beyond just wanting to fuck them. And um, what's the other difference between desire and love? Love makes you actually feel happy on a deeper, more wholesome level. You know, this day is the first fun day Phil's had in a long time. You know, he discovers that in actually caring and loving her as a person, he feels happier than he did just trying to exploit her for gain. And so that's the shift that makes him selfless. It's not because he thinks being a nice person will free him from Groundhog Day or it'll get him anything physical in return. He becomes selfless because he realises selfless people are, in general, much happier people. He realises life is more fun when you care. And that is a fact, and of course it's a fact, because selfless people sincerely care about others. And because they sincerely care, they have more genuine human connection with other people and the world and everything in general. And because they feel more genuinely connected, they then feel less lonely, less empty inside, and so more happy. Um, just as Phil felt happier spending a day with Rita chucking cards into a hat than he ever did attempting to manufacture this perfect day with her. Hey! <laughs> hey! Ow, ow! Are any of you up for adoption? <laughs> Yeah, so he does selfless acts and discovers how much more fun it is being in Puck Tawny as a result. You know, he enjoys the day more now, he enjoys the people, the community, and, and they end up loving him in return. Phil has now changed, it's not just he's a nice person now, it's that he's actually become happy as well. And becoming happy, Groundhog Day then ends. The 2nd of February finally, finally becomes the 3rd of February. And so why is he freed? What is the metaphor of Groundhog Day really about? Because um, there seems to be film theories out there, I had a quick look earlier, that feels dead and this is all really purgatory and all that stuff. Just I never really like film theories like that because I think they fail to understand the, the emotional message of the symbolism being conveyed. Um, so I don't think it's purgatory, I don't think it feels dead. In my opinion, Groundhog Day in its essence is as simple as that feeling we can all have that life is repetitive and dull and each day feels exactly the same. And as such, Groundhog Day ends precisely when Phil stops seeing life like that. It's when his approach to life changes, you know, when even if the days are literally the same, it doesn't bother him anymore when he doesn't mind being trapped in this town anymore, but actually enjoys it. And I think when we're unhappy with our position in life, we can get caught up waiting for life to change, to make our lives different. You know, when every day feels exactly the same, we start waiting or hoping for some big event to cast us off into adventure or love or success and fame. In, in Phil's case, it's the idea of this major network he's waiting to snap him up. Or in a wider sense in this film, uh, the metaphor of Phil being stuck in a town he wants to escape. But no matter what Phil does, he can't escape Puxatawny. Every day still feels the same until, until he stops trying to escape and starts to appreciate the day as it is, starts to accept his life, who he is, this surroundings as it is, you know, he starts to show interest and care towards other people and he starts to appreciate the little things like, like the piano that plays in the cafe, it, it, it sounds nice and it makes him want to learn the piano, not for success or to woo anyone or any personal gain just because it might be fun, just because he wants to play the piano. He ends up appreciating the winter and he even appreciates Groundhog Day, the, the celebration itself in the end. But standing here among the people of Punxsutawney and basking in the warmth of their hearths and hearts, I couldn't imagine a better fate than a long and lustrous winter. You see the point? This repetitive Groundhog Day is a symbol of Phil holding himself back. You know, life becomes this endless cycle because that's how he looks on it, as this dull, pointless, stupid thing. Life feels empty because he tries to elevate himself above it. And so for Phil, now, suddenly, it's not about him chasing after this elusive hope of escaping Parks Attorney or being snapped up by a major network, but it's about treasuring whatever the present moment is, whatever it looks like, finding beauty in whatever the world throws up for you. After Groundhog Day ends, he 
wants to live here anyway. He doesn't want to leave anymore. Let's live here. This isn't a film about a man escaping purgatory by doing nice things. It's a film about a man accepting life as it is, finding happiness by appreciating others and learning to care and connect with them. Until we open ourselves up to the world and try to connect, life will always feel for us like Groundhog Day. And so, fittingly, the last thing Phil says on the final Groundhog Day before February the 3rd finally comes is, No matter what happens tomorrow, or for the rest of my life, I'm happy now. Because I love you. That's the last point, that he's happy now. Finally, when he's actually happy is when the time loop ends. That's not a coincidence. Morning. I hope I've done you justice with a video about Groundhog Day made in four days. And actually, I've written the, I've written the script the same day I watched the film. Um, I've pushed myself. I've got now see if I can edit it in three days, I guess. And I'm sorry this hasn't been an in-depth scene analysis video like I've done with a lot of the others, which I did consider doing for this as well. I thought about picking a specific scene and breaking it down. Um, and there is definitely a lot more I could have said about this film, so I might even do a part two where I do analyse a specific scene or something. I don't know when I would do that, but someday I might do a part two. But I have some interesting thoughts about the metaphor of weather prediction. Because that's a big thing in this film, and the contrast of Phil Connors the weatherman with Puck's attorney Phil the groundhog who predicts the weather, who both have the same name, you know, that's no coincidence. For now, I thought I'd just keep this video to themes that are more along Christmassy lines, I guess. Um, the idea of appreciating life and all that stuff. Because that's kind of originally what Christmas, in its conception as the Yule celebration, was about in a way. It was about celebrating the end of the year, the end of a cycle with the winter solstice about appreciating how the cycle has been that year and ushering in the next one. Um, so, <laughs> so Merry Christmas, everybody. I'm looking forward to how this journey will continue in the new year. You've, you've all blessed me with your support and it really does mean a lot. But that's all I'll say for now. So thanks for watching and hopefully see you next time.